The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. The following show is brought to you in part by Not Me in Arlington, Massachusetts. Not Me is a nonprofit organization with a mission to promote, advance, and unify self defense education and training for at risk populations. Visit Not Me at www.not me.org. Bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene. And hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting adventure on As We See It. This is show number 46, being recorded on Sunday, June 17, 2012, which is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to any fathers in our cast here of thousands or in our listeners of a few from the city that was built on rock and roll, Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Ed Jupin. Out in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, we have Fred Boaz. Out in the wild, wild Midwest, we have Holly Hurley. Up in the frozen tundra of northern Vermont, we have Tony Mazuko. And back down here in Brookline, Massachusetts, Larry the Lobster. Before we get into things here, my little reference of uh, Boston being the city that was built on rock and roll, any of you music fans there would understand the reference. Myself and Larry the Lobster had the opportunity to see the current version of Starship, the band in Boston. And I'll tell everybody this, if you get the opportunity to see this band, and it's the first time I've actually seen them in any of their variations over the 40, 50 years that they've been in existence, from Jefferson Starship to the Starship today, they are awesome, incredible. They perform their songs from their entire library going all the way back to Jefferson Airplane in the 60s with what I guess was their first hit, White Rabbit all the way up to current days. Mickey uh, Thomas is in charge of the band currently, lead singer, and you could say for all intents and purposes, it's his band. He's been with Starship since the Jefferson Starship days in 1979. Prior to that, he was a solo artist and also a singer with the Elvin Bishop group. And probably most people outside of his Starship fame would remember him as being the lead singer on the super mega hit from the 70s, Fooled Around and Fell in Love, which he did with Elvin Bishop. That was in the mid-70s. Playing the role, as they say, of Grace Slick these days is a girl by the name of Stephanie Calvert. Stephanie has been with Starship for a few years now. My first thought, trepidation of going into this concert, never having even seen Starship live, was how is somebody going to replace Grace Slick. She's phenomenal. So check out her work or their work on YouTube or wherever else you could find it. Give a listen and a watch. Quite incredible. So if you get a chance to see Starship while they're out on tour or on this current tour, do so. So, how is everybody? Is Starship now one of our sponsors? No, it's just that they blew me away, and I think Larry would agree with me. It was a very good concert, and like very I said, good. I with all of the bands that I've seen in my life and have even worked concerts in my prior careers along with you, Fred, I'll tell you, with some of the big names I've seen, this current reincarnation of Starship ranks up near the top. They're really that good. They nailed it. That's what we want to hear. So what do you have? I got lots and lots of stuff. Uh, we, anyway, we're going to start off with no bit, a death today. Rodney King, the if you remember from your history, the gentleman who was, we saw videos of him being beaten by the Los Angeles Police Department back in the 1980s, died today at 48 years old. Suspicious circumstances, a heart attack, or we have any Oh, it's a heart attack. I'm well, they say that people found them at the bottom of his pool, of his swimming pool. His, his fiance found him at the bottom of his swimming pool, and police officers went to the bottom, removed him, attempted to revive him. But, I mean, it looks like they said there was no foul play, so... Yeah, probably a heart attack then, or that led to drowning or a heart attack and then just went under. Either that, or they said that he was drunk and possibly uh, high at the same time. Wow. So well, yeah, there you go. It's possible he was in the pool and, and intoxicated in one way or another, and, and tragically just and just drowned. Uh, an idiot. Yeah. yeah. The thing that people have to remember about what happened, the Rodney King incident, the beating of Rodney King by the Los Angeles Police Department, it was like 20 years ago, it, exactly, it right? Didn't it just pass its 20th anniversary? It stemmed the Los Angeles riots in which a truck driver 
white truck driver was pulled out of his truck and almost beaten to death. He was actually went to went to the hospital for a, for a long, long time. It sparked a lot of a lot of controversy because uh, it was the first time actually that 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 the press was known for having cut a uh, videotape down to three and a half minutes. What was actually a fifteen minute tape. Rodney King was found dead at the bottom of his pool. He did drown. He drowned and. Al Sharter released a statement, of course. This happened in 1991, exactly 20 years ago, as a matter of fact, or 21 years ago. But it was videotaped by a, by a bystander, the original beating, as LATPD officers severely beat him during an arrest. And there's a lot of backlash with that, a lot of rumors, a lot of innuendos. It happened. Let it go. Larry, so, uh, you have some information. Was he awarded any damages, monetary damages or anything out of all of this? What kind of background have you come up with on this case? As a matter of fact, he sued the city of Los Angeles and Rodney King and the city of Los Angeles. They settled for $3.8 million. Not bad for a beaten, huh? I, I take uh, a beaten for $3.8 million. Yeah, I think I would too. He was an author, and he was also victim of the civil rights violation. And there was a trial for some of the police officers. In the first trial, four LAPD police officers were later tried in a state court for the beating. Three were acquitted, and the jury failed to reach a verdict for the fourth. In a later trial for civil rights violations, two of the officers were found guilty and sent to prison, while the other two officers were acquitted. King was taken to the hospital for his numerous injuries, broken ankle, fractured facial bone, bruises, lacerations, and there was a blood sample showed that King could be presumed intoxicated. Now, so, okay. you know, Tony, this was, we talked a lot about this being the start of the riots, but this actually started a stream of events uh, in L.A. pretty much going through this beating to pretty much the shooting of uh, the big, was it the uh, the B.I.G., Notorious B.I.G. shooting as well? I mean, this, the Rampart Division came out of this. This was a... This was a huge insider of more than just the riots. It was it was some having to do really up through all kinds of corruption in the police. I mean, this was this was a huge incident within just the scope of, of what followed it. Correct, Tony? Well, that that Rampart division that you mentioned that was always a rough division anyway. I worked in the Hollywood Los Feliz and Doheny Drive areas of Hollywood. Ten years prior to that, in the early 1980s, and the Hollywood Hills was okay, but that Rampart Division of downtown, that, that was always one of the roughest areas. Wouldn't you say so, Fred? You're familiar with that also. And then we go well, back to Tony and Holly. But you have to remember, Ed, and, and people that have never been to Los Angeles have to understand that downtown L.A. borders Hollywood and West Hollywood and... Although we see Hollywood in the movies as this glamorous area, downtown Hollywood is is a dive. Is a dive. It, yeah, it's very seedy. A slump. It's very seedy area, and Rampart Division. And it's, I'm not trying to make excuses for what Rampart does, but the Rampart Division is dealing with the slum. It's a slum area. Hollywood itself is a slum area. People have to remember, and Ed, you know this as well as I do, when you look into the hills of Hollywood and you see that big Hollywood sign there, that Hollywood sign was not put up as Hollywood. It was originally Hollywood land, and it was selling, trying to sell property behind Hollywood. The land fell down, and they kept Hollywood up. Hollywood is not – most of your studios aren't even in Hollywood anymore. So Hollywood itself is simply a name now. It's a – a low-income area. You're, you're, you're down. It's your da regular downtown, inner city where you know you have a lot of problems in that area because most, you know, like you said, the Doheny Drive area up into the Hollywood Hills, over to Coldwater Canyon Avenue where I worked, down to Studio City. All of that in the hills that is higher income. Down to the valleys, you have your lower income people because they can't afford the high end properties up there. Even in Studio City, there are sections of Studio City, sections of North Hollywood, Burbank that are not the best around. And a lot of them are industrial areas. Holly, you were going to say and then take your conversation with Tony? Well, uh, essentially, I believe this is what led to the sort of tightening of. Tightening of the hold, I guess, the police were trying to tighten their hold on the area, and they gave a lot of license to the Rampart Division, which is sort of what led to the corruption that eventually led to a police officer being in the car. Allegedly, police officers were protecting Tupac at the time. Uh, that it got on the border of they weren't, they weren't any longer 
being the protectors, they were being a part of the problem. And then it then it became necessary to make other really look into allegations of all kinds of corruption within the police department there in LA. And at this point, you know, things have been cleaned up quite a bit, but it took a serious downward spiral of which the most people cite the Rodney King beatings as the beginning of that of that spiral and the beginning of that investigation because even though there was corruption before, this was such a blatantly open display that no one could argue with the fact that something absolutely unacceptable happened here. Right. This is one of those cases where, you know, if you put it in the context of the early 90s, this was the post-Cold War era, and, and a lot of people had thought that, you know, maybe we were in a post-racial era, and all of a sudden these, this video comes out. It shocked a lot of people, and it was L.A. too, so it wasn't like this was happening somewhere down south where people, not to say that they would excuse it, but, you know, you might still expect it, and I think it just shocked a lot of people. And then the violence of the riots... I think shocked the country at the time. They hadn't seen anything like that in quite a while. It had been, I don't know, 10, 15 years. 30 maybe. years to the mid-60s. Yeah, right. Or more since they had seen anything like that. And these, these were, again, some of the first modern riots you've seen. And I don't know really the extent that we've seen anything since in the country on such a scale. And, I mean, the media was all over it, so everyone knew about it. I remember I was a kid at the time, but I knew what was going on in L.A. I knew about the riots. I remember reading about Rodney King. It was a few years later that Tupac was shot. I remember actually specifically September of 1996, so about four or five years later. But it was a very, a very interesting event that really picked at the conscience of the country at the time. And, you know, he's famous for his Can't We All Just Get Along, which was mercilessly mocked for probably close to 10 years after that and finally uh, started to die out. But it, it was, again, where people in a modern sense started to say, well, wait a minute, is there still police, police corruption out there or police being overly violent? I think a lot of these issues had kind of gone by the wayside as the country focused on other issues for a while. And then again, as the Cold War came to an end, the early 90s was an era, you know, at least politically, of everyone sort of wondering what's next and thinking, hey, didn't we win? Shouldn't everything be good from here on in? The Rodney King kind of, I think, brought the country back to a time it thought it had moved past. I'm going to have to go negative here. It's tragic that the man drowned, but when he was pulled over by those police officers, which he doesn't excuse their behavior... He was thought to be under the influence of alcohol and drugs, and here, 20 years later, there's some other tragedy where he's thought to be under the influence of alcohol and drugs. So just another little commentary on our society and our unwillingness to give up some of our habits that ultimately don't lead to good conclusions. Well, Tony, there is one thing that was never really gone into by the press in 1991. That's the fact that the LAPD was the end of the story. The beginning of the story is a felony speeding chase right. that went for over 30 miles through Los Angeles County. And when Rodney King was finally ejected, brought out of the car, he had officers telling him, stay down. And he kept getting up. Stay down. He kept getting up. Stay when a man with a gun tells you to stay down, you stay down. Now, I don't excuse what the LAPD did. That's wrong. And, you know, let, let me make that, that point perfectly clear. What they did was wrong. But when a police officer tells you, stay down, you stay down. They were trying to handcuff him for a felony. He kept getting up, not listening to the commands given to him by the police. What they did, again, I'm going to repeat this, was absolutely uncategorically wrong. They should not have went, uh, gone the way they did. But... You're talking about a very large man under the influence of alcohol, possibly under the influence of drugs, who's not listening to the commands of the police at a felony traffic stop. That I'm not saying they were right. And I, but they're I, still, but they're know, still doing their job, or they still have a job to do. And, that, and that's they still have a job to do. And if he doesn't listen, how else are you going to control someone that is that belligerent? Because Ed, you and I have both worked in that type of situation. What do you do? I mean, the only other thing... You have to take them down. You have to you take them down. Him you don't let them get away. You have to take them down. And what happened, the press didn't show the entire 18 and a half minute video. They only showed three and a half minutes of the beating. They right, didn't show him being extricated. They didn't show him being asked to cooperate. Please don't get up. Stay down. Stay down. And he kept getting up, challenging the police officers. What they did yet, yeah, well, we're going to say it again. What they did was wrong. How they handled it was wrong, but when, it, when you're told and you keep challenging these people, what else are they supposed to do? they got to make split-second decisions. You're right, and you know, it, it brings up the recent Trayvon Martin issue uh, incident, whatever you want to call it, which was tragic, but was also a case where the media began releasing information in a very doctored way 
that would change your perception of what actually happened. And the media was very selective in the way they edited some of the conversations. Hey, the media loves doing that, Tony. You know as well in well, they your, do. And I do in, in your point, field of politics. Anything, you know, they, they only give you sound bites, and, and they, could, they could spin it. You know, the media could spin it in a certain direction. You're right, and I, I wonder if, if there hadn't been the explosion in social media and the web that there is today, maybe the Trayvon Martin issue could have bought into something, and it may still, that led to riots or something like that, because everyone just watched the way everything was presented, and once the facts came out, people realized it was a much muddy, much more muddy case than initially it appeared. And I think that didn't happen with Rodney King, and obviously I think people would have been outraged at the fact that there was the extent of the beating, but perhaps if the whole story had come out, it wouldn't have turned into a riot that led to something like 50 or 60 deaths and millions of dollars of damage. But I think the problem is, is that when you say like it, it we can weaken the story or it muddied the story, the the, it, the actual misdoing in both cases are still pretty clear. They're still there. As Fred said, you know, it doesn't excuse their actions. And right, I think they are. I think the I problem think is... Media should misinterpret things or say things or, you know, or should cut things, edit things in certain ways, because I do think that what it really takes, what it really takes the eye off of is the actual wrong that's been done, because then people like to dwell on the fact that the media did something instead of dwelling on the fact that there was a serious wrong done here, regardless of what the media did. The media well, should no. just be reporting the actual story. I think you're right. And if you look at the Rodney King incident, if that had all come out ahead of time, Maybe it never would have been an issue. They would have just been, hey, this guy was doing something wrong. The cops overreacted. They should be punished. End of story. The Trayvon issue is a little different, but it might have been the same thing. When the media does stuff like that, it gets so hyped up and people's emotions get going and they're running in, you know, at 110 miles per hour. And then in the end, it just nothing happens. Justice isn't really served. And I think it's, it's you know, another example of something that if the media hadn't screwed it up, it probably would have gone away in a way that actually solved the issue. He probably would have just been arrested and gone to jail. Now, it could be wrong, but the problem is, again, is that everyone gets all hyped up and they start going all in one direction, and then it's, well, now, wait a minute, but there's this. And I think we, we make too big of an issue out of something, and as a result, nothing happens. Yeah, I think that's true. And I th But, you know, this is something we've talked about before. I had talked about when I was working at CNN, and the Terry Schiavo case was front and center news, that re a lot of real news lost a lot of airtime because we were all talking about what people were doing in Terry Schiavo's backyard. It, we, well, you mentioned that story once, that story's over, you know, but America's fascination and the fact that news channels are now fighting for ratings, I think it just goes back to the whole reason BaseNet was created and the reason we're all here is that they're all fighting for ratings. They're not necessarily interested in reporting the story. I was going to say, hence the birth of After Dark, correct, Fred? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so... Shall we? Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, so that's sad news to report today, but we had to go into a little bit more depth on the backstory. What's next? Larry, it's up to you with your lobster tails or laws or whatever the hell it is. Number one, your ribs move about five million times a year every time you breathe. Number two, in 1880s England, pants was considered a dirty word. <laughs> Number three, Liz. in Ohio, one must have a license to keep a bear. Number four, in Colorado, a pet, if loose, must have a tail light. Okay, the license to keep a bear in Colorado. I would uh, imagine that would be... No, that's, that's in Ohio. Uh, well, wherever. I would imagine that that would be the case almost anywhere if they even did issue permits for it, which I'm sure you can't even acquire a permit to keep a bear anywhere. But that's kind of odd. Ohio yeah, I, I, I want a bear right? permit. Yeah, really. Yeah, right, you, know, yeah. Ed, you want people having a bear without a permit? <laughs> yeah. That's just strange. A bear, bear we need a per, well, permit to keep a bear. I, I mean, I guess it, 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 they, I'm sure they're talking about commercial enterprises, not people having them in their homes. At least I hope they are. Anyway. I would hope. I don't know. Ohio's one of those weird states. You never know what people are getting out to out there. Yeah, well, so what, we, what was that fourth one, Larry? We had a taillight and an animal outside? Colorado. A pet cat, if loose, must have a tail light. A pet what? cat, a pet cat yeah. if loose, might have a t must, must have, have a tail, a tail light. light. Must so have a tail light. So they don't get with a car, yes. Wow, what do you say about that? <laughs> that's as bad as a man in Missouri needs to have a permit to shave. That's yeah, that's pretty confusing. But also, like, if your cat is loose outside your house, chances are it got out without your knowing. So because people just lose track of their cats all the time, I find. That's a free fun. But isn't this tail light probably going to be heavier than the damn cat? How, how would that 
even work theoretically. <laughs> well, and I wonder if in this area somebody actually made tail lights at some point. Oh God, that's crazy. What does that product look like? Tail light. Yeah, tail light. Kind of yeah, like yeah. lobster tail. We'll act now. We'll send you two. So, what are number one and two? Before we get back to that, if the pet has to have a tail light, what if the cat is also required to have left and right turn signals? <laughs> Okay, I think we move on to numbers one and two. Number one, Lara. Your ribs move about five million times a year every time you breathe. Okay, Holly, you're the physical pet fitness hold, person. Hold on, hold on. I I'm going to call bullshit on that one. If my <laughs> ribs are moving that much, I'd lose a little bit more weight, especially with all the breathing I do. How is it that doesn't burn any calories? You're telling me my ribs are working all day long and I'm not losing any weight? All it day does, and all night. It does burn calories. It's just not enough. <laughs> no, Tony. Tony, that means Tony. That means you can't eat three pizzas a day and still expect to lose weight. But I breathe a lot. <laughs> What's it? The breathing diet? Yeah. It should be. According to Larry, I, I should just breathe all day long. I should be able to lose some weight. <laughs> oh God. Well, maybe. So that does work, well, Holly. You would say, or that's true. Number well, I think, one. I think that. I mean, I don't know that it's true, but I would say that there's a good chance it is. And as for the calorie burning. You know, you think about when you, if you've ever dieted, people tell you what your your calories that are allowed to keep you at the same weight per day versus losing a certain amount of weight per day are. And the way that they calculate those or the way that traditionally that was all estimated has to do with how many calories you burn doing things like breathing, sitting around, tapping your foot, ordinary everyday walking, you know, all that, all that gets into even just like sitting at your desk, you know, blinking, pumping blood, all those things burn a certain amount of calories and so tapping that's your foot I, does oh you know blinking pumping blood like your heart pumping your blood hmm. I mean all that stuff burns a certain amount of calories that's why you have a baseline recommendation from from your doctors and your and your fit, fitness trainers and they've basically figured for years there are a certain amount of calories that at a certain amount of weight your body naturally burns and that's why if you're if you're eating about the same thing every day you don't really gain or lose any weight because that's that's what you burn. And that's why people starve when they don't eat for three and four weeks at a time. Your body's pretty good at holding on to calories, but it does burn a certain amount of calories just being. Interesting. And what was number two, Larry? And we'll wrap this up. Number two, in 1880s England, pants was oh, considered a dirty word. Well, me well, and Tony chuckled at that one when you first read it. Well, yeah, what, what, weren't they calling pants pantaloons anyway? Yeah, pantaloons, right? Well, because they were referring to your underwear, right? Well, What's is that, that what they mean by pants or outer pants? Yeah, I think I usually think the word pants. pants. Yeah, that, well, I think when you said the word pants in the 1800s, it usually meant your undergarment. Oh, okay. I think. At least that's what movies tells me. Movies would never lie. They would not lie, no, correct. All right, so I guess win, lose, or draw. Oh, no, wrong show. But anyway, win, lose, or draw, that wraps it up for another lobster tail. So I guess we'll head back to some real news, or our first real news story of the day. Now, Holly, weren't you, uh, you were telling me or telling us that you had met Dario Franchetti the other day? Yes, I got to meet Dario Franchitti. Uh, he was actually at my office. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm working for the summer at Kimberly Clark. Um, and he actually was at my office because this weekend, some of you may know, he won the IndyCar at Milwaukee in the Cottonelle car. So that is a Kimberly Clark product. So there's a little plug for where I work. But basically, Dario Franchitti has just been dominating IndyCar for the last four years. He won the Indy 500 this year, 2011, 2000. Uh, he won it for the last three years and then, of course, took it again this year, 2012. So, so this guy's just on fire, and he's just really setting the world of race cars uh, light. And I think what's interesting about him, when he married Ashley Judd a few years ago, everybody said, oh, yeah, you know, she married some driver, some guy who drives, you know, and he has done NASCAR as well. And people said, oh, yeah, just some guy. Now he is uh, very much a celebrity just in and of the fact that he seems to be completely unbeatable. I have a funny story about Ashley Judd. You brought her up. We had talked about car guys on NPR who were doing their last show click and at, clack. The end of, at the end of September. Click and clack, correct. Well, several weeks ago, Ashley Judd happened to call into their show, and she had a car problem. But after she convinced them that she was actually Ashley Judd, who was a big fan of theirs and was calling in with a car problem, during their discussion, it turns out that she didn't really have a car problem. She had a husband problem. 
he does not allow her to drive when they're going somewhere together. He oh, insists yeah. that he has to drive. And she says, what do I do to get my husband to let me drive? She says, you know, this guy drives for a living. Let him take a break and I'll drive. And of course, Click and Clack said, well, how does this relate to your driving? And she says, no, I'm really a good driver. She says, and that's the point. This guy drives for a living. Take a break and let me drive. But he just insists on driving all the time. <laughs> just how to throw I that out there. That. I, not in my house. What, not in your house? What? Well, I go out, my wife drives, man. I don't want to drive if I can avoid it. I hate driving. See, I can kind of understand this because my, my husband took a Skip Barber course, and he's a pretty adept driver, and he actually he constantly fusses at me about my driving and always wants to be the one to drive. But the interesting thing is he is the only one to date, I'm going to knock on wood when I say this, that has actually had any sort of accident in either of our cars. So... <laughs> So, you know, it doesn't always play out. But I could see, like, if he's used to being in control of the car, it'd make him very uncomfortable. So, so, did, so did you get to this race that he won this weekend, since you're out in that neck of the woods? I did not. I was at Road America this weekend, which is a F4 uh, racing track. And that's so, you know, for those of you who are more Formula One fans, uh, it's a different kind of track, more curves. Uh, some of them actually happen on city streets. And I have a friend, uh, his name is uh, Alan Andrea, and he is a pretty pretty successful amateur race car driver and so we got to do, go do that this weekend so we still got to see some fast cars race but I didn't get to go with the group that got to go see the Cottonelle car race one of the other interns the intern who's on Cottonelle got to go I, uh, I am on the Depend brand so I didn't get to go. There's no Depends car? No uh, apparently that's not our target demographic. You think Although, that would have been a better fit because I mean if you if you jump in one of those cars you better be wearing your Depends. See, that's, I think I think it's actually very much our target demographic, but you know we're still shaping the brand. I hope to be a part of some major growth for the brand. You know. Hey, you have to get together with one of your previous guests on the Crashing Glass podcast that uh, created the Spuds McKenzie. Maybe That's we could bring Spuds McKenzie back in Depends or something. Yeah, well, or maybe maybe she could create an equally amazing product. <laughs> Spud would be, maybe for our, all his partying, he also should be in the Depends. <laughs> so what do you have next? Well, um, I guess that was obviously a pretty cool story, but we're going to move to from someone who is doing something going very fast to someone who wasn't doing something going very fast. Lindsay Lohan, apparently. I well, I guess. It, yeah. Oh, we're in the entertainment segment already. I guess so. Who oh, cares? Yeah, right. No, I, I've got to no, uh, actually go ahead, Holly. I'll let you finish before I interrupt. Okay, well, yeah, so Lindsay Lohan, allegedly, I guess she was sleeping in the ho her hotel room, and she was really tired because she'd been on set for three days, and they somebody knocked on her door and said she was unresponsive, and so they called 911, and they made her go to the hospital, and the 911 people were basically like, she's just really tired, guys, let her go home and go back to sleep. You know, or they, I, they responded. They didn't take her to the hospital. They came to her, the paramedics did. Sorry, go ahead, Tony. I, I just hate Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> and I just keep hearing about welcome her. to her, welcome to as we say it. I, I just I, I well, guess I'm defeating like Tony. Tony, Tony, how about giving us a who cares? Who cares? I still <laughs> wish this girl would just drive off a cliff so I'd never have to hear about her again. Oh. Then, <laughs> after ten years, there'd be some memorial and you know some news story about how she's been dead for ten years, and then I drive myself off a freaking cliff. Who cares? <laughs> she was washed up like ten years ago. I just don't care. I just. Uh, <laughs> I just don't. Tony, care. Tony, what has Lindsay Lohan ever done to you? Every, I'm addicted to the news, and every time I turn on the TV, it's something else about her, and I just don't care. For Christ's sakes, these stories go on and on. It's like watching paint dry. She's drunk, or she's in court, or she's. It's the same story over and over and over. Exactly. You know what? Somebody should just put them all together in one paper, mix up the order, and you could read them in any friggin' order, and it wouldn't matter because they're all the same. I mean, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell is Lindsay Lohan anyway? She's literally more famous for just being a screw-up than whatever crap acting job she's had over her miserable life or music or whatever it is she did. I just could care less about Lindsay Lohan and what she does and what's going on in her life. And then this story, to top it all off, she was tired, so somebody called nine one one. How many poor kids in LA? Got well, yeah, you know, I think I think that's the bottom. I think that's the bottom line of this story. This story was a non-story because you know, she, she apparently was, didn't require a medical I treatment. I tired. People would tell me to take a nap or to get off my ass and go do something. No one ever well, called nine one one. 
she thought she thought it was pretty ridiculous too. And in all fairness, Tony, I have to defend Lindsay Lohan's actual acting back in the days before she became a train wreck. I mean, Mean Girls was awesome. She's, oh, when she was a younger kid, she was okay, a teenager. Yeah, she's a good actress. You can you can knock her all you want for her lifestyle choices, but leave the acting alone. The acting was good when it happened. Actually, I no, wish she'd do no. more acting and less of the other crap. That's what I wish. I, I <laughs> look for the best for her because I enjoy her. You know how, like, 40 years ago, Bob Dylan kind of went into hiding and people barely heard from him? She should take a cue from that. Or Paris Hilton. When was the last time you heard the name Paris Hilton? Oh, she's another one. Don't even talk. Oh. Paris Hope? <laughs> yeah, exactly. At least she finally ran her course and people stopped caring. Well, well, I'm, well I'm, I'm with Holly on this one. I'm, I'm definitely the who cares about Lindsay Lohan. But, yeah, when she was a teenager, she had a couple good movies, so I have to give her credit for that. This goes to show you that the press has nothing else to report. No, obviously. And neither did the person have anything better to do that called 911. Wait a minute. Larry, where were you on the day that this 911 <laughs> call was placed? Oh, sorry. Hey, Larry, were you at Brugger's? I wasn't at Brugger's, but I certainly <laughs> but was But he was on not... the phone calling 911. <laughs> yeah, maybe well... it was. Well, was Lindsay Lohan blocking a fire hydrant? <laughs> oh, God. So from people who have nothing to do and were doing nothing for attention but got attention anyway, to Nick Walenda, who crossed Niagara Falls on a tightrope, getting a lot of attention for doing something really crazy. Did anybody see this? I not, I saw not live or anything. I saw the YouTube or the, you know, the YouTube news thing, reports. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I you know I'm a huge fan of people, but I don't understand what Tony. You're our, you're a resident historian. At what point did people start trying to do crazy stuff over Niagara Falls? Like in America, this seems to be a long-standing tradition, and I'm still trying to figure out what the appeal is of Niagara Falls specifically as a as a place for stunts. You know, the going over in barrels, the walking across on tide ropes, the swimming in it. The you know, what, when did this yeah, start? There's other. Fairly big falls just right here on the East Coast in Patterson, New Jersey. You have Patter so-called Patterson Falls yeah, Ed, that, that span the Passaic River, but people don't try jumping over that. Yeah, and I think Chris Christie's paying you to plug New Jersey every hour on the hour. <laughs> but as for uh, Niagara Falls, I mean, it's, it's been popular for probably well over a century. I think it was part of the reason is early on it was one of those vacation destinations that, you know, even a middle-class family 100 years ago – could go to when they're big and they're impressive and, and as for the crazy stuff my only guess is a hundred years ago people got bored and they needed something to do there were a lot of news stories about stuff like this back then because it really gathered the public interest in the same way that it does today it was people doing you know extraordinary feats and and you know interesting stuff that hey you know, we're talking about Lindsay Lohan back then they talked about people going over the falls in a barrel yeah and oh. now this nut job I mean God bless him and, and you know, more power to him but walking across on a tightrope Personally, I wouldn't do it. People were crazy 100 years ago when they tried stuff like that. This guy's crazy today. Kind of like that guy that uh, 20 years ago or whatever walked a tightrope between the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Good for them, but nut jobs. I know a guy personally who is a former, is an acrobat and did tightrope walking in a circus between poles. God love Nick Willenda, man. You ain't catching me doing it. I'm afraid of heights. But if you can do it, and Holly, yes, why Niagara Falls? Why not Niagara Falls? I mean, it's just like climbing a mountain. They climb it because it's there. It's something to do, a feat that no one else can do. And it's like Evil Knievel shooting his rocket cycle over, over the Grand Canyon because nobody else has ever done it. It's something you can do that nobody else has ever done. And Nick Willenda has always wanted to do this. His entire life, this has been a lifelong dream, walking across Niagara Falls. Now, Nick, you did it. Put your stuff away. Go home. So, I mean, Niagara Falls is, is you know, it, it's an American thing. It's a Canadian thing. It's a northern New York thing, however you want to phrase it. I guess I agree with Fred. More power to this guy, but... You're not going to catch me doing anything like that. And the yeah. thing is, you know, 100 years ago, they had no internet, no television. And a lot of this stuff, especially places like Niagara Falls, people didn't travel the way they do now. It took them a lot more time. And having someone cross the falls in a barrel, and especially if it was publicized ahead of time, would draw people up there, up into the mountains, up into the area from the Adirondacks, from the uh, from Lake Jordan, areas like that, from New York City, bring them up there that they could witness this guy doing this, and they'd pay money, and, and the town, it would help the town revenue. So a lot of this stuff 
come from uh, the generation of revenue back in the 1800s and the early 1900s. I just, I think there's always been those people. I think you said it best, Fred. There's always been those people who say it's there and just have this crazy urge to do something. It's like swimming the English Channel or anything like that. People just go, I, I got to try it. And I, I just think it's amazing. I mean, of course, this guy was a Walenda of the, the famous circus family, the Flying Walendas. So it, it's in his blood, and they're very calculated risk takers, and they they do this sort of stuff, have done this sort of stuff for centuries. So I guess it's appropriate that it was him, but you still just think, gosh. <laughs> and apparently as in, he didn't want to wear the harness, but ABC told him they wouldn't cover the, the cost, which was a little over a million dollars, if he didn't wear the tether. So... So that I thought was interesting. And he said he didn't have to use the tether, which I think means he crossed successfully. Yeah, maybe we should have Lindsay Lohan cross the, uh, the tightrope there. God, Tony. There well, you go. Moving on to, well, I don't know whether this is less or more offensive. Apparently, your, they have found that race is actually correlated with how well you sleep. Okay, so okay, I, I sleep. Another race issue coming up. So I sleep three hours a night. What race am I? <laughs> um, wait, wait, wait. I, I, I think we should let Holly read the rest of the article before any of us make any comments because uh, <laughs> I can't think of anything appropriate. Well, it's essentially, they have found that, I mean, the study accounted for socioeconomic factors and like low, educa low education and low income, uh, both of which we know can increase stress and keep you from sleeping well but they also looked into they basically when you do this kind of regression you can net out certain kinds of factors like weight diabetes high blood pressure because some of these things interfere with sleep and they've actually found that a certain percentage of how much you sleep it's not stated here but actually has to do with what race you are they said that blacks hispanics and asians slept less than white people black people on average get six point out eight hours of sleep compared with 6.9 hours for Hispanics and Asians and 7.4 hours a night for people who are white. And they say that basically even though every racial group other than white people seem to be getting less sleep, allegedly only the black population has been reported that they suffer poor sleep quality, whereas uh, Asians report significant levels of, day, of daytime sleepiness. So I don't know. I mean, it's interesting because they say Asian has lower body mass index typically. And so it's, it, they, 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 they think that it's not necessarily caused by your race, but that your race can be correlated to the average amount of sleep that you get. There you go. I'm going to withhold comments in the event that offend everyone. Well, go ahead. That's what the show is for. I mean, the thing is, Ed said he sleeps three hours a night. My wife sleeps five hours a night. What does that, what does that make them black now? I mean, you know, that, 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 that's what they're thinking. Okay, see, Tony, you didn't want to offend anybody, so Fred I'll, does I, I don't matter. I'll do it. I mean, the thing is, a lot, a lot of it, 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 it's not just, and I understand, not just race. It's ra it can be race-related, stress-related, business, job-related. If you're unemployed, you may, you may sleep less because of the stress involved being unemployment. But no, this is one of those things, I mean, you sleep how much you sleep. You, you know, it, it, people shouldn't be, you know, they, 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 they sleep eight hours a night. Some people sleep five, Ed sleeps three. Some people take cat naps during the day. You got pa people power napping during the day. I would say you know, that they're, it, spending their, they're spending their money on studies like this. I would say that it probably relates more to economic ba your economic background in poverty than anything. And this is going to sound strange, but this is actually based in my own observations. But in, in, to use my the least professional sounding words I can, the poorer you are, the less likely you're to have a nice house. Ergo, the less likely you might want to be to spend time in that house. And people I've known who have been on the lower end of the economic spectrum don't always have the nicest houses. Yeah, or you may so, not even in that economic environment, you might not even have air conditioning, and it's just exactly. too damn uncomfortable to sleep at night. They did say in the study that they think that social factors are more likely to be the cause of it, you know, like you're talking about socioeconomic standing, and they did net some of that stuff out, and they do believe that these factors, environmental factors and geographical factors, are definitely a part of the study, and they, they actually chalked up a lot of this difference in that, but the thing that is typically shown by these studies is correlation not causation so they're saying these things may be caused by these environmental factors that you're talking about you know not having as nice of a house or as comfortable of a bed or air conditioning or being very stressed which I think I think some people might even argue that you know you said 
socioeconomic can sometimes be correlated in this country to certain kinds of races at this point. Hopefully that won't always be the case. But in the same vein, there is a certain, there's a certain culture of working harder and sleeping less among Asian communities that may be the cause for them. So it's, inter it's interesting that they can actually correlate it to your race, even though all these other things may actually be the cause. So we had uh, another big news topic that pretty much ate up most of this past week. A little topic called immigration and a presidential An executive, order. executive order by President Obama. Actually, I think what really should be done if these undocumented immigrants want citizenship, whether they have to comply with the two years, I think that if you want citizenship, you should be taken into custody by ICE and you can apply for citizenship right then and there when you cross the border instead now, Larry, of... Larry, in all fairness to, the, to, to what's going on, a lot of these people are kidding, uh, that the president is, wants to grant the, I guess, immunity to, for lack of a better word, is that these are people that a lot of them are kids of people that came here on their own, the kids that may have been born here, kids that are under uh, up to the age of 30 years old. Many were brought here against their will, and he wants to give them an opportunity to, to basically to have the same opportunity as citizens. The problem I have with it is that their parents have broken the law and have done nothing in the time that they've been here to rectify that situation. We've talked about this in other shows that there are other, and I don't tout what goes on in Europe, but I know from what my mother's told me that when she grew up in Switzerland, she was born in the United States of parents that were here legally on green card, what the equivalent was a green card in the 1920s, we're not expected to return. We recall that uh, to Europe when Hitler attacked Poland. They, you know, when my mother married my father, who was not a Swiss citizen, her Swiss citizenship was pulled. You didn't get it automatically. When you're a guest worker from another country and your child is born in Switzerland, they are born of the country that you live in, not the country of Switzerland. Because they cherish their citizenship, and we give it away like candy. Now. I understand why this happened, that during the 1920s, 30s, 40s, we're trying to populate the country. We're bringing in all the people from overseas and streamlining them through the citizenship, allowing them their children to have automatic citizenship was a great idea. But these people came here, most of them, with the intention of becoming United States citizens. The problem we're having now is people are crossing the border knowing that they're breaking the law. They're running from the Border Patrol, getting here, having kids, and now the kids want citizenship, and your parents intentionally broke the law. That's where I have a problem with it. Right. Now, so what this executive order was, before we turn it to Tony, is they need to be over the age of 16, under the age of 30, as Fred said. They need to have graduated high school or obtained a GED or have been honorably discharged from serving in the military while here in the United States. They must have lived here consecutively for a minimum of five years. They must not be a felon, and they must not also have a serious, whatever, you know, however the fine line is going to be, must not also have a serious misdemeanor against them. If they can meet all of that criteria, this executive order will give them a two-year deferment on being on potentially being deported. So basically, it'll help them fast-track their citizenship. If they don't get their ducks in a row in that two-year deferment period, and the two years runs out, at that point, they are open to being deported. That's simply what the executive order is. You know, I'm, and I hate to go negative here, by and large, it's just a political move by the president. This measure doesn't really have that much teeth. The claim that these individuals are, are living in fear is not the truth. If you've ever known anyone who has a questionable status in the uh, immigration process, and I've known quite a few, and I'm sure, Ed, I know you have too, some of them we've worked with, they never live in fear of being yanked and, and pulled out. I mean, as much as people may want to make it seem like it happens, it's rare that the government just butts down doors and kicks out people who are you know, here illegally. It's usually they've done something, and this is not that I'm saying that it's their fault when I say they've done something that draws the attention of the government. It's just that's how the federal government is aware of it. And sometimes it's not their fault they're working in a factory that the feds decide to raid or something like that. But even that is fairly rare that it actually happens. So the actual measure is not going to do very much. Most of these individuals are generally pretty productive to begin with. The, the 16 to 30, they're in college or whatnot. They'd probably be able to get citizenship pretty easy one way or the other. 
I think the president pulled it as a political move because he's showing lower poll numbers with Hispanics than they would like him to see. And if you really read in it, it, it just doesn't have that much teeth. I think he just did it similar to his support of gay marriage. Not that it's something he doesn't believe in, but I think the president is really trying to shore up his base and, and deliver some blows to Mr. Romney, which is just not happening. And that's not a, a judgment call on the president's part. He's going to do what he's going to do to try to win an election. But I think it was more a political move than anything. And I think he's going to try to drum up more than anything. He's going to try to drum the issue up to try to make Mitt Romney look bad, to have to have him come out and say, well, no, I would throw these, you know, 16 to 30 year old kids out, et cetera, et cetera. So my analysis is it's more a political move than anything. The well, see, that, that hap hasn't happened. Romney is actually in a roundabout way, he's not making an official statement to rebut this, but in a roundabout way, he said that he more or less agrees with the president's theory behind this, but as opposed to it being coming from an executive order, he thinks that Congress should pass a law. You know, he wants the immigration law passed and not have it just be an executive order. So that's kind of wishy-washy, too. Well, you know, I kind of agree with the president in theory, but I don't want it to be an executive order. I want it to be a, an actual law. Well, it, so he, he kind of is in agreement with it. He is. He, he's being smart. He's not taking the president's bait. Right. Because, and again, and I always clarify this on viewpoint, and I think everyone knows that I'm not knocking the president in this sense, even though I don't like him. He wants to make this election about everything that isn't the economy, and if Mitt Romney has half a brain cell in his well-coiffed haired head, he will absolutely want to make this election about the economy. So I think it's the president trying to say, hey, let's drum up an issue that's not the economy. And Mitt Romney saying, meh, well, I don't care. We'll go with you on this. Let's go back to talking about the economy. So no, I don't think that that's true at all, actually. And I don't, I don't really think that this is necessarily. I mean, I think this, this, the timing of, of all of these things, the timing of everything that any president, including any Republican president, it's political. has ever done. Yes, of course, there's politicalness in the timing, but Obama has never changed his his has never changed his stance on these things. Whereas Romney has openly said that he would veto the. Act, and now there's got, there are new things coming out, and now he wants to sort of get some more Hispanic voters. So you can't say that this is not politically timed on his part, either on Rubio's, who was considered as a running mate for him. You, you can't say that you can't just say up and down how Obama's doing all this stuff for political timing. They're both they're both doing things for political timing, obviously. And when it comes to when it comes to the Republican Party, they're also trying to they're they're scrambling a little bit to try to get voters that they have previous to this actually purposefully alienated with all with all kinds of policies about about wanting to immigrate and all this sort of stuff. Not wanting to get immigrants out of the country. The best, thing, the best so. thing they can do in this country is change the immigration laws to make it easier for these people to get in. Do it through Congress, get the immigration laws changed so that they fit the time that we live in. Be a Republican, Democrat, because neither side is moving on the immigration issue except passing laws that are granting people who broke the law, rewarding them. Take these people and say, look, you're here, here's what you do to get citizenship. Make it a streamlined process that doesn't take more than a year to get your citizenship because sitting around for five years going to 17 interviews is just stupid. And I'll tell you, the only reason I'm behind this executive order is, and I am behind it, is because it's just a way, it's a short-term fix, as everyone, including the president, announced that it's a short-term fix to this problem, to help fast-track this certain group of only 800,000 people out of like the 19 million illegal immigrants or aliens here. 19 million. This only affects about 800,000. Over a two-year period, it'll help fast-track those 800,000 to citizenship. Well, you know what? Get them the hell off of the illegal list and let them get their citizenship. 800,000 people, help fast-track them. It's a short-term fix. This isn't the law. This isn't anything permanent. We still have to come up with the immigration reform. It's a short-term fix. And looking at it in that light, that's why I'm in favor of it. I think that was going from one kind of hotly political topic here in America to one over in Japan. Uh, they're saying they're going to restart their nuclear reactors despite uh, uh, the fear behind that. That's a hot topic. Yeah, no <laughs> it's a hot topic. I, I don't know why. The problem is with with the with the restart of this thing. I want to know what they're going to do to 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 ensure the safety of this plant after the last one that went bad in Japan. 
I say cover it in concrete like they did Chernobyl in Russia. Here's the thing. I don't I, have a problem because I don't have a problem with nuclear power in and of itself. I have a problem with when something happens that they have no way of fixing it. I worked at the Avalcan nuclear, nuclear power plant in Avila Beach, California, as security for a number of years, and these people had no provisions that in case something happens, what in the hell do we do? You, know, you can contain as much as you want to. In and of itself, nuclear power is cheap. It works. We know it works as we're using our nuclear safe. submarines. And the problem is that you know we had just had a disaster in Japan, just had the best disaster in Chernobyl. I don't want more stuff floating over the shores from Japan that is contaminated. And you right, had right. Three Mile Island right there in your backyard uh, in 1979. Nuclear power has proven, and I'm a fan of it over the periods of time, to be exceptionally safe. The problem in Japan, other than the fact that it was nearly a 40-year-old plant, and they're not building plants there or here as fast as they should, and we're actually in the process of losing the technological ability to do it. They were built to standards 40 years ago. If you had an earthquake of that magnitude and a tsunami of that magnitude that occurred that close to Boston, the city of Boston would be gone and never come back. Partially because Boston's built on swamps and, you know, that wouldn't happen. But people forget about that. The Fuka, Fukushima plant, I believe I'm saying it right, the big problem there was the tsunami followed by the earthquake. You almost can't build a plant to be safe for either of those. Now, Chernobyl, we all know, was a situation where they didn't want to shut one down and they didn't want to shut the other down. And they were trying to stay in favor with the party bosses. And somehow that led to a nuclear explosion. And it was a tragedy. I don't mean to deny that. But I mean, any other city in the United States or the world, if you had a tsunami and an earthquake of, of that magnitude, you know, the nuclear power is the least of your concerns. Again, if that had happened that close to Boston or to New York, there'd be a whole lot more damage than the one nuclear plant could happen. As for them restarting it, you know, I'm not a nuclear engineer. I don't know if that's a good idea or a bright idea. I would hope they've checked it out properly, but I well, I, just... think, I think the the actual public there in Japan is, is nervous about this for the reasons that you stated. This is a country that has had several earthquakes and tsunamis over the last few years, and they really feel like, regardless of what they feel about nuclear power, they're just really not sure this is the right place for it for those reasons. And I think there's they have a valid point, and I'm sure the Japanese government doesn't ever approach anything lightly. I think it's fairly safe to say, but it's, so if they're going to allow this to reopen, there's probably a very good reason for it reopening, too. But I can understand why, why the Japanese people are sort of not fans of the plan. You know, once you've been in a situation like this, you don't really want to, you really don't want it to happen again. Yeah, other than, you know, Japan, I've always found it interesting that the the only nation that's ever had a, an atomic bomb used against it is otherwise wholeheartedly embraces nuclear power. Now, part of that's because the country has zero natural resources, but I've always found that, that that's pretty interesting. But if you notice the way Japan's history has worked in the last 100 or 200 years, they do approach things very cautiously. And I think you're right. You bring up a point. The Japanese government doesn't seem to just sort of do anything willy-nilly. It's not like they're, you know, Australia or some other country that just sort of flies off the handle. No offense to any Aussies out there. I, I would think that they've taken all the right steps to make sure this isn't going to happen again. And I think going, for, going forward, you'll see more reform and more smart reform there in how their plants are built and protected than you would see in another country where it might get bogged down in politics. I think they're going to do it right going forward. Whereas, again, if this happens somewhere else, the solution might be, nope, it's bad, don't do it, shut everything off and never go near it again. I mean, I, I think that I think that it's one of those knee-jerk reactions that you know the public has. After September 11th, we all had our knee-jerk reactions, and I think every public that has had a scare has a knee-jerk reaction. So it'll be interesting to see sort of how this goes forward. And I think this is, I mean, this may not be related to this specific incident, but I mean, Japan's use of tariffs is really been a genius way for them to keep things going. You know, so. So that you mentioning they not have not national resources. I mean, they are very good at making financial decisions, though, at least in the last... Right, they, they, they absolutely are. And I think that's why things like Toyota for so many years have been such a high quality and Japanese goods are known for being a high quality is they realize that they need to export, and we're going a little off topic here, but they need to export that quality because it's all they have because they're a country that doesn't have the natural resources that the United States or Russia, for instance, has or all of Africa. So they realize that that quality is sort of what they're able to export to make up for the fact that they don't have huge mines and oil deposits and, and forests and all that jazz. And that there's 130 million people crammed on a tiny couple of islands 
So yeah, uh, but it's it's also a cultural difference. These people have a pride in their work that their oh, work well, is their work is the most important thing. That if they per that if their company fails, they have personally failed. If that car comes back in because of a problem, they have personally failed and. It's a, it's an attitude that this country has lost because yes, you know I mean they're they're recalling now a bunch of cars because of a drivetrain. They said oh, we installed it properly. Bring your car in. We will take care of it for you. Yeah, they're not yeah. immediately out on on notification. These recalls these cars, but the Japanese have always been that kind of quality. You know, my country first. My 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 company first. I give up my time for my company. Now there's a movie with Michael Keaton called Gung Ho. Which shows that attitude of a of a car company, Asan Motors, moving into a small town in New York State, and they have all kinds of problems with the American attitude versus the Japanese attitude, and they work it out. It's a cute comedy movie, but it's there that I've met people of, of that culture that are, oh, I have to stay, I haven't finished my work yet, ah, go home, no, 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 I have to do this because it's my dedication to my job. Right, and I think that's why I, I have faith that if they're restarting this plant that it's going to be a good thing and that they've taken care of whatever it is they need to take care of. Now, we are, again, talking about very, very complex. I mean, I couldn't even begin to imagine how a nuclear power plant actually operates, so you never know what's going to happen, and I can understand their concern, but I have a feeling that they would make sure it's done right. I mean, I remember some of the workers going back in trying to plug one of the leaks or something, knowing that it was very radioactive, but it was that same dedication that they knew they had to do it, and they had to make it right, and they were willing to do whatever it took. Yeah, so I guess, uh -huh. do you guys have anything else on your plate for this week? Well, well we before, before you guys go into obits and we start wrapping things up, I just want to let everybody know that our little game show of... The Lobster Stumps the Announcer is on vacation until after Labor Day. Larry the Lobster won for the first round of the show, so he leads the series one segment to none. And it will return shortly after Labor Day, along with Gene White. So stay tuned after Labor Day for The Lobster Stumps the Announcer. And he was studying, too. <laughs> That's what he gets for studying. True story. So, guys, are we down to obits now? Now we're down to obits. Wow, time just flies when you're having fun. Oh, yeah. And the, fun, and the, the first one coming up is the death of Frank Rudolph Cady. Now, if you don't know who Frank Cady is, Frank Cady was an American actor who died recently, died a couple of days ago, actually died June 8th. Frank played the part of Sam Drucker on Petticoat Junction and the related shows that went with it. Uh, in a fictional town of Hooterville. He was the general manager, general store, postmaster. It's kind of a, a smart aleck guy. But Frank was a good, uh, a very, very good actor. He was born in Susanville, California. In high school, he worked at a local newspaper, the Lawson County Advocate. His family later moved to Wilsonville, Oregon. He spent a lot of time using a lot of television, a lot of movies, and Father the Bride, The Asphalt Jungle, When Worlds Collide, um, Ace in a Hole, the Big Carnival, Rear Window, had a very, very lucrative career. He was married to Shirley Cady from, from his wife Shirley from 1940 until, 19, until 2008 when she passed away. Has uh, two children, Catherine and Stephen. Has three grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. He was a well-known actor. You knew who he was as soon as you saw him on the stage. And I personally, I love the man as an actor. I love his acting ability. I mean, he started, his first acting gig was 1948, kept going till 1990. Well, that's a, I mean, it, it's interesting to think about someone having a career like his that went all the way from Petticoat Junction up to, I guess his last movie was, or his last uh, appearance was Return to Green Acres in 1990. I mean, that's just, that just kind of blows your mind, doesn't it? To have, I mean, I guess he started in 1948. And oh, yeah. to be making movies for, for that long, I mean, that's a blessing. It's quite a career. So I guess, are we moving on to Yvette Wilson now? Also, Lord, Yvette Wilson. Yvette Wilson, she died Thursday after bat bat battling cervical cancer. She was an actress best known for her role on the UPN sitcom Moesha as Andrew Wilkerson. Now, I never saw the show, really don't know who the woman is, but in reading her bio, she actually did quite a bit. According to TMZ, Wilson had a stage four cancer at the time of her death. That just scared the hell out of me because... 
you know, I know a few people have had breast cancer and cancers like that, and just scares the hell out of me. But her reaction when they asked, you know, ask them for friends, for people, her friends, her friends had F cancer. It, it's just she's 48 years old. I mean, I'm 56. I'm gonna be 56 in October, and it scares the hell out of me. Well, you know, she had a really interesting career, apparently. I, I did watch Moesha, that was of my era, a couple times at least. But I also saw the movie Friday, Poetic Justice, Don't Be a Menace, like a lot of the things that she was in. And her career is interesting because, you know, she started stand-up comedy on a bet, like on a dare. Someone She lost a bet and had to do it at a birthday party and then just never turned back, which I think is cool. But as to the cancer, Fred, you know, what's what really speaks volumes about her, she had... She had kidney disease as well as cervical cancer, and she was in need of a transplant. And even at the time of her death, a friend of hers had created a website that raised about 46% of the bills that would be needed to get her that, that kidney transplant. So obviously, she was very much loved by her friends, and just judging by the fact that so much of the other things that happened in her life were going on, it's really... It's, it's sad that she died at 48, but it's really amazing with those two things going on that she was as prolific as she was and, and just got so much done in one lifetime. I mean, having cervical cancer and kidney disease is not something you hear usually people being able to do for a very long time. So it's amazing, and she was a very talented comedian, and I think uh, it's very clear that the entertainment business will miss her presence. Okay, so with that, I guess we're done for another week here on As We See It. And um, just want to remind everybody that you could follow us on all social media sites at BaseNet TV. You could email the show at awsi at basenettv.com. Visit our website, basenettv.com, for all of our programming and look sometime early July for the re-premiere of our flagship show, After Dark. I guess that's it, huh? Boy. Hey, what's, what's, nice, what's a re-premiere? Nice and easy. A re-premiere. We're premiering the premiere again. Well, you'll you'll just have to watch and see. It is a re-premiere of sorts. Oh, you know so. I'm watching. Oh, <laughs> I hope so. We ran even a little longer than normal, but it seems like we had some quite interesting topics here today. So, from Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. From Swiftwater, Pennsylvania, in the Pocono Mountains, I'm Fred Boas. From Burlington, uh, Vermont, I am Tony Mazzucco. From Nina, Wisconsin, I'm Holly Hurley. And from Brookline, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. And I want to remind everybody to listen to GMM Radio, all of the best music from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s at gmmradio.com. See you next time.